in fact, I was the third president, he was in fact a paleontologist. And the fact that he studied fossils was a pretty interesting thing. And we were about to open this really cool exhibit here in Washington, D.C. at the Smithsonian American Art Museum about Alexander von Humboldt, who was this amazing German scientist who visited Jefferson uh, briefly uh, at the turn of the last century, around 1801, um, to talk to him. And the reason he came was that um, he, had, he knew that Jefferson was interested in fossils, and he had found a fossil mammoth or mastodon in South America, and that's what he uses in a letter of introduction to Jefferson was, I've, I've also found a mastodon. And in fact, there was this incredible discovery in 1801 in Newburgh, New York, by a guy named Charles Wilson Peel, who was not only a digger of fossils, but also a painter. And it's kind of looking like the snowmass dig, actually. But this is the first complete mastodon ever discovered in North America. And Peel dug it, painted it, and put it on display in his museum. And here he is. This painting was painted in 1824, um, after he has, had, had a long career as a museum guy. You can see the Behind the curtain is the mastodon. You can see some mastodon bones there. They called these things mammoths back then, even though they were mastodons. Uh, but the key thing was that when Humboldt visited Jefferson, he spent several weeks in Washington, D.C., down in, 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 at uh, Monticello. And then he went to Philadelphia, and Peel hosted a dinner for Humboldt underneath the skeleton of the mastodon, this mastodon. And in 1802, it was called the Year of the Mammoth in North America. And the way to think about it is that the 19th century was a century of mammoths, and the 20th century was a century of dinosaurs. And um, here's that actual mastodon skeleton. This is being installed in the Smithsonian American Art Museum about four months ago. This is the original skeleton collected in Newburgh, New York in 1801. It's been on display at the museum in Germany called Darmstadt ever since then, and we borrowed it back for this exhibit. So it's a mammoth, mastodon skeleton on display in an art museum, echoing back to our nation's early paleontological history. Now here's an image of the Smithsonian as it looked about 1860 or so. You can see that the Washington Monument is not completed. Um, you can see the one Smithsonian building the castle, and if had you been here in the 1850s or 1860s, in the castle was a group of men called the Megatherium Club. And here's one of these guys. And that animal there is a gigantic ground sloth from South America called Megatherium. And these were a, a number of famous scientists of their time, one of them being Edward Drinker Cope, who went on to be the paleontologist that had the big bone wars with uh, Othniel C. Marsh. And um, in that same building, in the Smithsonian uh, castle, in 1879, they formed the U.S. Geological Survey. And here's uh, Clarence King on the far right. He was the first director of the U.S. Geological Survey. And the survey went west on a series of expeditions, brought back all sorts of fossils. And those fossils formed the core of the Smithsonian's fossil collection, which is the world's largest fossil collection. We have over 44 million fossils here. And it's stored in many buildings, quite a remarkable collection, but obviously a collection that's great for an exhibit. Here's Marsh. Marsh, as you know, worked entirely at Yale Peabody, but he got federal funding. And in late in the feud between Cope and Marsh, uh, Cope sued Marsh and said, look, you've got federal funding. Much of your fossils should come to Washington. So most of the fossil dinosaur collections at the Smithsonian were collected by Marsh for Yale and then forced by a lawsuit to come to Washington, D.C. because Cope hated Marsh so much. As a result, we have a lot of really cool marsh dinosaurs, including the first Triceratops from Denver, is here in our collections, collected by one of Marsh's guys. And here's a model of Stegosaurus, one of the classic Colorado dinosaurs, but um, we have one from the Marsh Filch Quarry, and we'll show you in a little bit. Now, jumping forward from the 1870s and 1880s, in 1908, here is what the Carter Museum in City Park, Denver looked like. This is the museum that would then be called the Colorado Museum of Natural History and then the Denver Museum of Natural History, and then the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. Here's what it looked like in 1908. And I've been doing a lot of um, genealogical research, and I discovered much to my amazement that my grandmother moved from Marquette, Michigan to Denver in 1896. And she was born in 1892, I think. So when the museum opened in 1908, she almost surely would have come to that museum. Here she is on her wedding day in Denver in 1915. 
Um, but her uncle was uh, called himself Denver's photographer, and he's actually got photographs, and I've never been able to find the killer photograph, which is my grandmother at the Denver Museum, but I do have photographs he took of City Park, so I know I'm going to find that photograph eventually. But the fact that my grandmother probably was there for opening day of the Denver Museum in 1908 is something that sort of charmed me having worked at the Denver Museum. And of course, you know the saga of prehistoric journey. The big skeletons were mounted in the 30s. The guy down at the bottom on the lower left leg is, uh, is uh, Philip Reinheimer, who was the uh, guy who started out as a policeman in City Park. Then he started working in the museum, manning the uh, coal-fired power plant, and then he became a mounter of dinosaurs. And he built this Diplodocus skeleton from uh, Dinosaur National Monument. This picture is taken about 1937. Uh, from the 30s on, where the Denver Museum kind of slowed down in its activities and collections in paleontology. And um, it wasn't until Richard Stuckey got back to the museum in the late 80s that the things picked back up again. And I owe, owe a huge debt of gratitude to Richard Stuckey. He's the guy that hired me at Denver um, just about 30 years ago today, actually. I went and did my interview at the Denver Museum in uh, June of 1990. So yeah, just about 30 years ago. Today, I had my interview with Richard and he hired me as a halftime collection manager for the museum and uh, that started my career at the Denver Museum, which lasted for 22 years. And Richard had a great vision to revive paleontology at the Denver Museum by building an exhibit that came to be called Prehistoric Journey. And so here's the picture taken in 1993 of that same Diplodocus that had been on display since 1937, being dismantled by Ken Carpenter and Brian Small and the Paleo Lab crew at that time. Here's the bunch, and uh, there's Ken Carpenter, always smiling, um, with the Stegosaurus skeleton that was collected in 1937 in Garden Park. And then on the left is India Woods Allosaurus, which we found and, and put into the exhibit. And Richard, um, when I showed up for work on January 1st of 1991, Richard said, all right, we just got funding for the prehistoric journey, and you're going to be the paleontologist in the project. So off we went. And my first five years at the Denver Museum, was working on this incredible project. And it's still, I think, one of the coolest exhibits in the world. Um, but it was fun to put it together. Ken and his crew did all the work. And I think that's one of the key things about the story of Prehistoric Journey that's lost in the just of time is that Prehistoric Journey was one of the last exhibits, last big exhibits, last big permanent exhibits was built entirely with in-house staff. This, we had the entire exhibits team, we had the preparation team, we had the scientists, the entire prehistoric journey project was in-house. And no big museum in the world does that anymore. They have all sorts of different consultants and contractors that come in and do all sorts of kind of work, but the Denver Museum built prehistoric journey by itself. And it's a real uh, thing to be proud about with this incredible exhibit. One of the things that Richard did was he gave me a budget to go buy some remarkable invertebrate fossils because we didn't have too many invertebrate fossils at Denver at the time. And I had a complete blast acquiring things like these incredible crinoid slabs from Indiana or these amazing psychopage trilobite from Morocco or this Dichronurus trilobite from Oklahoma or this incredible bundle of baculites from South Dakota or this remarkable um, Sphenodiscus uh, Ammonite from South Dakota, or um, we also worked with the paleontologists that were at the U.S. Geological Survey in Denver. Now, unfortunately, Denver shut its paleontology and branch down in 1995, and I'll come back to what that means. But at the time, Bill Cobbin, who worked at the USGS in Denver, was the grand old man of ammonites, and he loaned this specimen to us for exhibited prehistoric journey. Um, I'll come back to Bill and what happened to that collection near the end of this talk. Right before the exhibit opened, we were gifted this incredible double Didymosaurus specimen, one of the most amazing ammonite fossils ever found. And that became a trend of like we last minute additions to the exhibit. And the goal for Prehistoric Journey was to build seven beautiful reconstructed ancient ecosystems, but also have just a few really exquisite fossils in the exhibit. And the dioramas themselves were just amazing things. This is the, right at the end of Denver's history of building dioramas. There's Kent Pendleton a diorama painter looking at the blank wall that would become eventually the Cretaceous Creek bed. And we had volunteers snipping away at plastic leaves. I hope some of you are actually watching this talk. We clipped out and made 22,000 accurate Cretaceous leaves to go into the Cretaceous Creek bed. And you can see a, a Lyrodendrides bradicae tree coming together there. And Kent getting ready to start painting. 
And the team in the, in the uh, taxonomy lab built an incredible Stygimoloch dinosaur pair coming together. Here's the clay. And eventually, we get the Cretaceous Creek bed diorama. Seven of these dioramas, each one amazing in their own right, each one uh, kind of a miracle because Denver had its long history of making dioramas. And these are sort of the last of the diorama sequence. There's 104 dioramas at the Denver Museum, and uh, seven of the last eight are in prehistoric journey. And here's the team. Uh, picture taken near the beginning of the process. You can see the Admonosaurus skeleton is mounted, but none of the exhibits are around it. And uh, that's the team that built the exhibit in-house at the Denver Museum. And here is a snapshot taken at the 10th anniversary of the opening of Prehistoric Journey in 2005. And you can see Brian McLaren with uh, gray hair. He was the project manager. Richard Stuckey, the chief scientist, Francis Kruger, and Rebecca Smith. And I made the fifth, and there's five of us were the ones that oversaw the construction of Prehistoric Journey. Still one of the most proud moments I've ever had is the opening of Prehistoric Journey. Now let me jump back to the National Museum of Natural History because Denver opened in 1908. The museum I'm sitting in right now when I talk to you opened in 1910, two years later. Here is what a, a, a card looks like from the museum in 1910. And the building was modeled after one of the buildings in Chicago from the 1893 um, Chicago Exposition, the Columbian Exposition. So we didn't really have a very original design, but it's an amazing, beautiful building. And when the building opened in 1910, there was a giant hall devoted to extinct animals. And you can see in 1910, 11, it didn't look like much. There were a few skeletons coming in as they started to assemble things. Um, but after a few years, a few more skeletons started arriving. And this hall took on the nickname of the Hall of Extinct Monsters. You can see a triceratops, an Irish elk. There's a, um, looks like a bacillosaur, a mastodon. And you can see in 1917, they're putting a few more things in there. It's kind of nice to see what this hall looked like back in the day. Basically just mounted skeletons, typical of the time. But they then acquired, like Denver, a Diplodocus skeleton from Dinosaur National Monument. And in 1923, that skeleton was mounted in the hall. And by, here's a picture taken in 1931. And um, I recently discovered something that just charmed me to death, which was this. And this I was going through my mother's paper and I found this envelope. And if you look closely at the envelope, it's from the Smithsonian Institution. In fact, that card I showed you um, was from this envelope, the picture of the museum. And you can see the, uh, the envelope is addressed to Warren and Leroy Pierce, 822 South Beach Street, Casper, Wyoming. Well, Casper, Wyoming is where my mom grew up. And it turns out that in 1939, my mom and her sister and my grandmother went to Washington, D.C. for the Daughters of the American Revolution uh, Convention. And they went to the museum I'm now the director of. And I thought, God, it would be so cool to find a picture of my mom visiting my museum in 1939. And I was going through some files and I actually found that picture. And here she is on the right hand side is my mom at age 10 in Washington, DC, standing in front of the White House actually um, on her trip to Washington. And so cool just to imagine 1939 and then here we are 2019, a long time later, almost 90 years later. Um, so here's what the museum looked like when I got here. I left Denver in fall of 2012 and uh, this is a picture that was taken in 2010 and the 100th anniversary of this building. And you can see a sense of the size of the staff. And you know, actually the staff size here is about the same size as the Denver staff. Um, we have a lot more people in the scientific arena. Denver has more people in the public facing arena. Um, but the dinosaur hall in 2010 was a complete nightmare. It still had the same diplodocus in the same position that it was in 20, in uh, 1931 when my mom saw it. So my mom was in this room in 1939, saw that same Diplodocus in that same posture. And you can see the walls have kind of creeped in and skylights are darkened over. It's, there's no story and it's just a complete traffic jam. So we said, let's, let's actually just scratch this. Let's go back to bare walls, let's start again, and we'll build a brand new history of life uh, exhibit in the space of the Hall of Extinct Monsters. This was made really possible by this guy on the right. This is David Koch, one of the Koch brothers. He made a $35 million gift to the museum. And on the left is um, Paula Apsel, who runs NOVA at WGBH. 
That $35 million gift came in just four months before I arrived at the museum. So I had the great pleasure of arriving and having money in hand to start building the hall. This is Kay Berensmeyer, who is sort of the Richard Stuckey of the National Museum, the person who led the paleontology teams around the development of the exhibit. And we came up with an idea about deep time that was quite a bit different than prehistoric journey. The goal of prehistoric journey was to walk people through ancient environments and take people back in time and show them the past. The goal of deep time is to use the lessons of the fossil record to make people think about the future. And you know what, one big thing that's happened since we built prehistoric journey between then and now is we've come to understand that, that climate change is happening now at a rate so fast that during the lifetime of a kid that's born today, we'll see as much climate change as there's been since the Eocene to the present. So we're presently changing the world at geologic rates, which makes paleontology profoundly relevant to our future. I was probably in the office about six weeks when I got a call from the front desk and they said, there's a little kid downstairs who says he's got a box of donations for you. And I was like, well, send him up. And they sent this little blonde kid up. His name is Skip Hammer. He was four years old. And he was carrying that box that was covered in dinosaur stickers. And he hands me the box and I open it up and it's got 271 bucks in it. And this kid is basically called all his friends together and decided that on their birthdays, they'd pool their money to get the dinosaur hall repaired. So I was psyched because that was gold because at the time I was looking for more money to fund the thing. And I can always say, well, a four-year-old gave me 271 bucks. Surely you can give me 271 bucks. On the right, you can see uh, Matt Carano, who is our curator of dinosaurs. Matt had actually been a field assistant of mine when he was a high school student when I was working in Denver. And he's now the national dinosaur curator. And he led the project of designing the hall. One of the first things we did was take the, the exhibit crew out to North Dakota. And you can see Tyler Leeson in the middle, uh, in the blue shirt there on the left of center. And uh, who else? And Rich Barkley, a couple of Denver folks are in this picture where we took our educators, our exhibit folks, our scientists out to get the team put together on the start of the deep time. And no other thing in the world like going out and digging fossils out in the American West. Um, here we are um, digging a fossil site called Skunk Hunt. And then meanwhile, back at the National Museum, we were taking Artiplodocus down. You recall the picture of Ken Carpenter, his guys taking the Artiplodocus down. Well, down comes ours. But now we're not doing the construction on dinosaurs in the building. We shipped all of our fossils, every single one of them, up to Research Casting International near Toronto. And they did all the work on the skeletons up there. But it was pretty fun to see another Diplodocus come apart and the hall start to open up. We, moved, we also had a big zephactinus like Denver does, and we, um, you can see that our crew couldn't resist catching the thing on a light, light tackle. Um, and we also had these remarkable murals were painted by Jay Maternus. He's the guy that's on the right-hand side being interviewed by Matt Carano. There were six of these gorgeous um, 12 by 25 foot murals, all of ancient Cenozoic scenes. These are classic paintings. We knew we wouldn't have space to put them back up in the new hall, but we decided to roll them up and conserve them. And in the course of doing this work, I went out and visited Jay at his house. And if you look in the middle of the picture, you see a very long-legged bear. That's a short-faced bear right in the middle of the image. When I visited Jay, he showed me he had these troves of incredible pencil drawings. And you can see here's the animal with the muscles. You can see the overlay with the skeleton. Here's the overlay with the fur, all drawn by hand in pencil. He had thousands of these images. And I was like, oh man, what are you gonna do with these things? He said, you know, by coincidence, I just recently added a codicil to my will and I'm willing them to your museum. I'm like, well, that is good news. And um, Matt Carano and I decided to make a book about Jay Maternus, which I'll show you in a bit as part of this prehistoric uh, deep time project. Now, one other thing that was a problem was that we did not have a Tyrannosaurus Rex. Now, now that is Denver, um, in terms of one on display. And it's kind of a problem these days. You're gonna start a national exhibit in this country, home of T-Rex and not have a T-Rex. So I um, did a lot of work and found out that there had been some negotiations started already between the Smithsonian and the US Army Corps of Engineers and the Museum of the Rockies to get one of the Museum of the Rockies T-Rexes transferred to us. And we got the one that was found by Kathy Wackel. And that's the lady standing in the middle of the picture in the light blue shirt. 
Kathy was um, hiking with her family in the Fort Peck Reservoir in 1988 when she found one little tiny bone, which turned out to be the arm bone, the upper arm bone of a T-Rex. And when she took it to Bozeman, Jack Horner said, whoa, that's pretty cool. And they went back and there was the whole skeleton. So the entire skeleton was at Bozeman and we were able to um, work with Jack Horner, there's Matt Carano, and um, acquire that for our exhibit at no cost. Because T-Rexes are pretty expensive and here was a complete Beautiful T-Rex collected on Army Corps of Engineer land. I, of course, had to go and um, make a deal with the Army Corps of Engineer. And here I'm shaking hands with Tony Felkhauser in Portland, who oversaw those things. And we eventually got FedEx to FedEx us our T-Rex from Bozeman to Washington, D.C. And here it is being delivered in front of the National Museum in 2014. Here it is being unveiled in the rotunda. Just one femur, another general from the Army Corps of Engineers, Kathy Wankel. Uh, myself, and of course, Skip Hammer. Remember the guy who gave me 271 bucks. He became my best friend. And the cool thing about Skip was that he kept showing up. The next year he showed up with another box of cash. And in fact, he was a regular donor. Every year I could count in October that Skip would show up with a box of cash towards the renovation of the hall. Then we gutted the hall. This hall had opened in 1911. It had grown all sorts of layers of extra architecture. And we just took it right down to the steel studs and started going back. We uh, put in scaffolding up to the 60 foot high ceilings and started working on the entire infrastructure of the building, redoing the air handling, the electrical systems, um, even the plaster. Here we are scraping off the old plaster that was over 100 years old and putting in new plaster, um, finishing it all up on top of that scaffolding, reopening the skylights. And meanwhile, up in Toronto, the team was putting together are skeletons. And the skeletons were amazing things to behold because um, they had really lifelike postures. Matt was really intent on making our skeletons look like real animals doing real animal things. Here's the T-Rex munching on a triceratops. Um, here's one of our um, board members, Corlin Whitney from Seattle. You can see Matt in the background putting together our stegosaurus. And we had the benefit of being able to scan the bones, create the animals in um, three dimensions in the computer, print out 3D models, and shape those models the way we wanted them. So you could start with a 3D model of a, a mammoth scraping snow and then design your mount based on that 3D model. Very nice way to actually test drive stuff without having to bend steel to test what things look like. A lot helpful. And here's Matt, who is really the brains behind the beautiful mounts. One of, I think, the most exquisite mounts was one that was an animal that would, had been in the museum forever, the Irish elk skeleton. And those things have massive antlers. And Matt had a genius move of mounting the animal on its knees. So the antlers are right at face level. And somehow it makes the antlers seem so much larger when you're looking at the animal mounted on its knees. Skip came back with more cash as he always did every year. And here's Ed Warner, a board member of the Denver Museum of Nature and Science who's joined the board here and uh, funded the, Edward, uh, the Warner Hall of Humans at the Deep Time Hall. So Ed, it is um, playing double time and supporting natural history museums across the country. Here he is talking to one of the lead um, contractors from the design firm of Reich and Petch, who did the um, design of the exhibit that was going into the building. We had incredible artwork by Julius Sustoni, a uh, Vancouver-based painter who did remarkable murals for the new hall. And we took Marsh's original stegosaurus. This one's from Canyon City. So remember that um, you have two stegosauruses at Denver. One found in 1937 by the high school teacher. The second one found by Brian Small in 1992. And this one was found at the Marsh Felch Quarry in the 1870s, uh, mounted as a roadkill um, stegosaurus. And here's one of our giant ground sloths, elephant-sized sloth called the Remetherium, collected in Panama in 1954. And once we had that T-Rex in there, remember that the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers were very proud of that. So I was starting to host tours by great herds of U.S. Army Corps of Engineer generals who would come to Washington, D.C. for their gatherings. And Skip came back with more cash. And um, we got more cool fossils, things like this incredible fossil uh, crab from Washington State with barnacles on his back. And there was a fossil I'd been watching since 2003. It was discovered in Kemmerer, Wyoming by a guy named Jim Tinsky. And here's what he found. This is from the fossil lake beds up at uh, Kemmerer. And these are ancient lake beds that are marl. And often when you split the rock, you'll see that through the rock, there's something in there. And when he saw this, he knew he'd found an amazing fossil. 
you can kind of see the backbone and legs of some vertebrate animal. When it was prepared out, it was this incredible, complete protorohippus, probably one of the best fossils ever found in North America. A little tiny horse, literally every single bone intact on this animal. You can see the fish lying around it where they died and fell into the lake. And it's pretty easy to imagine a scene, but National Geographic recently published this great photograph of um, a cougar lying at the bottom of a lake bed in Patagonia. And it's, here it is. And this is like the scene that made that fossil. That animal dies, sinks to the bottom, it's covered by silt, and 50 million years later, you have a museum specimen. And I was able to acquire that specimen with the help of a, a very generous donor. And it was those kinds of things, working at the National Museum, I feel that, like the Hope Diamond, it's my responsibility to get the iconic objects of North America on display for all North Americans. I had good pleasure when I was in Alaska doing the Making of North America film to find this incredible palm frond with my friends Jim Bachel and Ray Troll. And we put that back together and installed it in the museum as part of the story about how Earth's climate used to be much warmer than it is today. And nothing like the two words of Alaska and palm to make that point. One of the other things we did was we worked with Scott Wing and his team to build the first ever complete um, climate curve for the last 500 million years. So we have a strong thread of not only evolution going through it like the prehistoric journey has, but we also have a very strong climate thread going through the deep time exhibit. And then Skip came back again. All told, Skip came seven times with more than 270 bucks a time. And so at the age of 10, he joined our leadership donor circle because he'd broken like a threshold to be in the leadership circle. So um, it's a good thing. And, and, you know, kids are, as you know, like, Dinosaurs and fossils are like just candy to kids. They're the, I've been always called them the gateway drug to science. And we are living here in Washington, only about 30 miles from a place called Calvert Cliffs, which is these Miocene cliffs that fall off into the Chesapeake Bay. And in these cliffs are incredible Miocene fossils, including things like these amazing megalodon teeth. And here's a kid who's just found like the find of his life, a giant megalodon tooth. And it occurred to me that it would be stupid of me not to have a megalodon in the National Museum. No one's ever built a life-size real megalodon. So I worked with uh, Gary Stott, former Denver Museum guy who lives in Missouri now, to um, build a life-size 52-foot long megalodon. And here's the piece of the thing coming together. Here's Gary fixing its mouth. And here it is being hoisted into place in the museum. And there it is hovering over our diners in the Ocean Terrace Cafe. And here is the shot of the National Museum of Natural History staff who built the deep time exhibit. So it's kind of a deja vu thing here. 1990 to 1995 was prehistoric journey. 2012 to 2019 was deep time. Same kind of deal, but very different exhibits, but the same topic. And it's just amazing to me how compelling paleontology and the history of life remains to museum visitors. Here is the... Um, the gala party that happened two nights before the actual opening in the big rotunda of the museum, an amazing moment as we're getting ready to lift that curtain, the life-size Paleozoic forest curtain to let people into the exhibit for the first time. And then the day before we did the formal opening, I invited Kathy Wonkel to bring her family to Washington, D.C. to see the T-Rex that she'd found in 1988. And she arrived with 145 family members. So this is the entire Wonkel family from Montana visiting the Montana T-Rex. Then the great day occurred, June 9th, last year. We uh, Mr. Bones made his camera appearance. He drove all the way from Denver all the way to Washington, D.C. And you can see time and time again, I kept going back to Denver as a source of ideas or people or content for the deep time exhibit. And on the opening day, Skip Homer got to lead the crowd into the hall after his seventh donation. Now he's a 10-year-old. And um, another part about this story, remember the USGS closed its paleontology and strategic rebranch in 1995. They had literally 2 million fossils sorted in 1,100 cabinets at the uh, USGS Federal Center in Denver. And it's a gigantic warehouse building 810. And these fossils were literally abandoned by the USGS there. And we had, when we were building the collections facility for Denver, we had some conversations about maybe moving the fossils to Denver, but we didn't have enough space to do it. And I knew that if I didn't solve this problem, nobody else would. That these fossils 
didn't belong in a warehouse. They included some of the incredible fossils from the surveys of the Western territories dating back to the 1870s. Incredible things. And I thought, I've got to figure out a way to do this. So I went back to FedEx and said, hey, will you transport this gigantic collection from Denver to Washington, D.C. for me? And we did the calculation. It was 23 tractor trailer loads full of fossils. And we then spent over three and a half million dollars, bought brand new cabinets, and we've been installing in this space a brand new um, Denver collection. And we were just three truckloads away from finishing when the virus struck. So we're nearly done with this project. Here's what it looks like right now. An incredible Denver collection moved to Washington, D.C. for permanent um, stewardship in the national collections, the USGS collections that were saved. So I was really proud of that. We did this fun book about Jay Maternus's paintings called Visions of Lost Worlds, the Paleo Art of Jay Maternus, which shows a lot of those murals and the drawings. And then an anthropologist studied the entire process of making the Deep Time Hall and wrote a book called Extinct Monsters to Deep Time, Conflict, Compromise, and the Making of Smithsonian's Fossil Halls. I'll leave you with my friend from Denver, again, my friend from Denver, with a picture of a fossil. And the idea that um, it was so much fun to make the prehistoric journey hall. And it was so much fun to make the deep time hall. And the big question for me now is what next? Because we now have this amazing museum. We are um, in the middle of discussing what's gonna happen with between 30 and 50,000 square feet of unused exhibit space. And uh, with that, I'll stop and I'll answer any questions people have. That sounds great. Thank you so much, Kirk. That was an amazing adventure through the wildlife hall, uh, through your new exhibit. Um, go ahead, everybody. If you have any questions, drop them in the chat. We'll try to answer a few of them before we wrap up here. Um, we have a couple comments. Lots of people are very excited to see you again, which is great. Um, I think uh, one of the questions here in the chat um, is how did the gnomes end up in prehistoric journey? I know there's uh -huh. yeah, yeah. The gnomes got in prehistoric because Kent, we saw Kent Pendleton, the guy who was painting the diorama. He, he painted dioramas and it was his idea to put gnomes in. He is the he was the gnome painter, and he looked like a gnome too. I don't know um, where Kent is these days, but he uh, there is as, as you know one in prehistoric journey right in the back of the Ornithomimus in the Cretaceous Creek that diorama. Cool. Um, there was definitely there was another question about uh, elves in deep time. Are there any elves that traveled with you? <laughs> not that I'm aware. I, I did not travel with gnomes when I came to Washington D.C. Uh, all right, Nicole wants to know: Did the Conodont collections from Denver make it to the Smithsonian? Um, in, there was yeah. some talk about that. Yeah, in part they have. Um, there, we are working our way through the remaining collections at Denver. The pollen collection is being packed right now, and there's a big Conrad collection also at the Reston USGS facility. But we are slowly absorbing the USGS collections as they go out of the business of being in paleontology, which is a tragedy. But the fossils will be preserved at the Smithsonian, as was the original intention, because in 1879, when the USGS was founded, it was founded at the Smithsonian, and the founding document says. When they're done with fossils, they come back to the Smithsonian. So we're just doing our job at the National Museum there. Great. Oh, tons of questions coming in now. Um, right. Do you handle temporary exhibits or are there any plans for a traveling uh, deep time exhibit? No, we don't. I don't think we're not going to travel deep time. We do, um, unlike Denver, which has a lot of uh, traveling exhibits, we build short-term temporary ones. We don't really travel too many exhibits. In fact, when I first got here, I decided that traveling exhibits didn't make too much sense. We have so many visitors, it makes more sense just to build an exhibit and let it soak here. But we have started building exhibits where we give the exhibit away for free. It's a digital exhibit. And one amazing story is that in, in May of 2018, we opened an exhibit called Outbreak, Epidemics in a Connected World. And when we built the exhibit, said there's a pretty good chance there'll be an, a pandemic happen while well, this exhibit is up. And sure enough, um, that exhibit predicted the COVID pandemic. So that's been one where we've we've made digital versions of it. Um, I mean, literally once you can print out the exhibit, not just a digital access, but literally you can print out the panels and everything, which are now in 140 locations in 40 countries. And we're giving them away for free rather than renting them. Because I think that our mission is to communicate um, the meaning of things. We don't have to take dollars to do it if we have the ability to give it away for free. 
Oh, that's amazing. Uh, just an additional addendum to that question. Brooke wants to know what kind of new technologies are emerging to create new exhibit experiences. There's a lot of things that are being tried right now. And I would say that it's, it's sort of, um, it's curious because a lot of these things are things that you think would be really cool, like uh, virtual reality, or augmented reality. And we've tried a bunch of them and they're not as effective as you might imagine because the museum visit is a social visit. You're with friends and family. And if you kind of go into your little box and do something digital by yourself, you can do that in your basement at home. So um, we are searching for new and interesting technologies. And I'm, I'm really grateful for the work that was done in Denver around science on a sphere and the planetarium and those areas where we're kind of experimenting with ways to help people see data and larger picture things. But I would say that I'm, I'm becoming, even, even now, even in the middle of COVID, even when people are saying, well, now you're totally digital. I'm like, no, the real thing really matters. And it matters more in a world where everything else is digital. Definitely, that's great. Um, let's see, uh, we have a couple questions um, about the snow mass project. So um, Shelly said early in your talk, there was a mastodon. Um, how are those tusks preserved? Because the ones she worked on from the snow mass project tended to fall apart. Yeah, no, they, um, you have to stabilize them. The ones that are being installed at the American Art Museum from Darmstadt are not real tusks. Well, often people will make fiberglass tusks because even if you had them, they are so heavy that mounting them would be a real challenge. Um, but, uh, you know, I, it, during the making of the uh, Polar Extremes Nova show, which aired on February 5th of this year, which you can watch by just Googling Polar Extremes, it's, it's streaming. I went to a gold mine in the Yukon where the tusks are just coming out of the ground like it was snow mass. It's amazing. And those guys have a way of putting on ring clamps and putting glue and you, you dry them very slowly and they do actually end up sticking together pretty well. Great. Uh, James says, ancient animals are great, but how about ancient plants? Uh, do you have exhibit space for ancient plants and what they tell us about ancient climates? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, as a paleobotanist, the at leaf doctor is me. And um, uh, not only that, but there are a couple of my colleagues here, Scott Wing and Bill DeMichael are also paleobotanists. And we had a couple of postdocs. So we actually had four or five paleobotanists. And again, in Conrad Lavandera, who studies um, insect damage on fossil leaves is here as well. So there are a number of really fun fossil plant exhibits in the prehistoric, um, I keep saying prehistoric journey, in deep time. I'm always schizophrenic about Denver, Washington DC, prehistoric journey, deep time. But we have some really cool fossil plants. We did have one that really broke my heart not to put it in the exhibit. It was a, um, a 10 ton slab of rock that had the entire top of a, um, Paleozoic tree from Iowa in it, but we just couldn't figure out how to stabilize the floor underneath this gigantic 10 ton slab. So that's in storage out where we store the whales. And if you ever come to Washington, DC, you can come see it. Very cool. Uh, do you anticipate displaying the amazing drawings that you mentioned and are now willed to you? And is that book available now? Yeah, you can get the book on Amazon. It's um, easily purchased and it's pretty inexpensive and it's a lovely book. I mean, they did a great job of the, of the um, printing and binding of it. The Jay Maternus is still alive, so his will has not gone into effect. He's still painting paintings in his house in, in Fairfax. Um, and we do have the big murals rolled up. So I do actually hope one day to do some sort of Jay Maternus exhibit because those murals are exquisite things. And when we had them in the actual exhibit, uh, before I tore the exhibits down, it, it was actually um, pretty interesting because they put a bunch of stuff in front of the murals, a lot of skeletons and exhibit stuff. So you couldn't really even see the paintings. So now, now we had the opportunity to maybe mount an exhibit where just the paintings themselves are presented. And they are just incredible things. You can get right next to them and swear you're looking at hair, not paint. Yeah. Amazing. Um, I don't know if you have been to the museum, but we have the After the Asteroid exhibit. Do you have any comments about After the Asteroid? Um, you know, this is the one, this is the one for the Corral Bluffs site? Yes, yep. So, yeah, I mean, I don't know you know, but when I, I got to Denver in 1991 and Ken Carpenter took me to Corral Bluffs in the fall of 1991. And I started working there. I kept thinking, this place is really awesome. It's gotta be something to be discovered down here. And it wasn't until Tyler, 
Lisa and cracked the code and found out that those little crumbly nodules were actually skulls. And I can't tell you how many of those things I looked at and said, ah, oh, that's nothing and threw it over my shoulder. So I, I think it's great that that project came to fruition. It was um, ongoing efforts of the still happening Denver Basin project, which is never gonna end because the Denver Basin is so full of amazing fossils and people are gonna keep stumbling on them. But uh, I haven't seen the exhibit. That's why I was coming in April was come check out that um, exhibit and I hope to see it sometime soon once we can travel again and who knows when that's going to be. Great. Uh, Roy wants to know, are the USGS fossils going to be lost forever in storage like Raiders of the Lost Ark or can they be accessed, studied, and perhaps assembled someday? Well, this is the thing. They were headed towards that at the Building 810 Center. They were going to be basically forgotten and lost out there. There was no money being put into their maintenance or care. One single person was managing the whole collection. So now what we've done is we've moved them to brand new museum storage. And we, at this museum, and this is quite remarkable, the National Museum, and the reason I came here was of the scale of the place and its impact. We have the world's largest collection of anything at any museum in the world. So we have 146 million objects. And as a result, we pull in an incredible number of visiting researchers. And every year we see between eight and 10,000 visiting researchers who come to look at the collections instead of the collections. But that's the scale of that is so vastly much larger than Denver that um, it's the size of those collections and their access that makes these fossils better here than in Denver. Because you might say, well, why not just leave them in Denver? But um, A, there was no place to put them, and B, they'll be seen by literally thousands more people here in Washington, D.C. And that's the role of the National Museum is to provide cover for the regional museums. And that's what I like to do in our interactions with all other museums. But it's as you can see, I, I still am very deeply rooted in my thinking and mentality and memory in, in my lovely 22 years in Denver. That's great. All right, some logistics questions from Matt. How on earth do you transport an entire T-Rex from Canada after it was assembled? Oh, uh, what they do is they assemble it and then they disassemble it in pieces. And it literally went into wooden crates in foam cutouts. So every single bone was put in a, in a foam cutout spot in a wooden crate and they traveled in FedEx trucks back and forth. So you'd never move one fully mounted. That's great. Uh, lots of questions about road trips. You have lots of uh, willing volunteers to go with you on your next road trip. Uh, are there any more road trips with Rachel on your calendar? Well, some of you may have been watching the prehistoric road trip on PBS, which has been airing, aired the last two Wednesdays with Amy Emily Grassley from the Field Museum. And clearly, um, she got the idea from cruising the fossil freeway. And Ray and I went on to publish a, um, a new book called Cruising the Fossil Coastline. And that has an exhibit associated with it that right now is in Fairbanks. It's gonna open in Seattle in December. And Ray and I did a, um, a live show for the uh, Washington DC crowd, which you probably, I could probably send you a link to if you wanna actually watch that. Maybe you can put that on your um, collateral stuff. But um, Ray and I have been talking about what next, what's the next spot, whether it's going to be the East Coast, because we did Rocky Mountain region in the West Coast, the East Coast is a natural, or maybe it's Europe or something like that. We don't have an answer for that question yet, but we're definitely talking about it. And just watching Emily on her prehistoric road trip makes me realize how much fun it is to go on a road trip. Absolutely. Um, Rebecca says she saw the deep time exhibit uh, in mid-June last year, and she said there's a strong emphasis on climate change. Did mm -hmm. you receive any pushback in the political realm, or did you have a lot of independence to use this lens in the development? Yeah, I, I treat climate change like evolution in, in prehistoric journey, which is like, this is science. I'm not going to take any pushback. And uh, we didn't really receive any pushback at all. I, mean, I think that's one of the things about um, the climate story is that it has become a political issue and uh, delivering it in context like we do in deep time um, is maybe a better way to take it. But it, it is crazy that we live in a country that's so rapid to deny science. So we're seeing that with the virus right now. We saw it with climate change. We saw it with climate evolution and creationism. And um, you really, I think the role of our museums is just to keep laying the science out there as clearly as possible and as hard as possible. And I, I'm extremely proud of this, the climate story it's in deep time on the mall in Washington, DC. And also if you haven't seen Polar Extremes, that's uh, my second attempt at talking about climate in a popular way. But I think climate is a really important topic. Pandemics are really important topics. 
Um, but the bottom line is, and this is what we're talking about for our next table here is this next century is when people and nature come into full collision and we have to find a way to make that be palatable and positive for both people and nature and not destructive. And that's the challenge of our century. It's the Anthropocene challenge and climate's just one manifestation of that. That's great. Just a couple more questions if you've got time. Um, Kathy says an important part of the prehistoric journey experience is interacting with volunteers in the lab and we want to give a shout out to our volunteers that are joining us today. Do you have a similar experience using volunteers or educators in deep time? So this is where prehistoric journey is kicking the Smithsonian's butt right now, I gotta say. Like I've been trying to bring the volunteer ethos from Denver because I had had such fabulous experience with volunteers from my leaf whacker crew that did the fossil plant work to the paleo lab folks, the people who worked in the prehistoric journey exhibit to people who worked all around the museum. You know who you are, you guys are awesome. You uh, give such additional power to museums. Volunteers are the secret sauce of museums. And we have volunteers here, but not nearly as many as Denver. We probably have about a thousand. I think Denver's at 1800 now or something like that. Um, we have a couple of challenges. One is that we have no parking. So it's hard, you can't get, you can't drive a car and park to our museum. Um, and we also have a brand new paleo lab and we haven't quite figured out how to make that work just yet. We haven't got, we, we have some volunteers in there, but again, I, when I was visiting Denver, I guess last year, it was such a joy to look into the, pre, the prehistoric journey paleo lab and just see it crowded and just buzzing with activity. And um, we've got plenty of fossils to prepare here. We just have not quite dialed in, but our plan is, to, to really mimic the prehistoric journey experience, putting meet people on the floor in the exhibits and people behind the window in the lab. So right now you guys are winning, but I'll try and catch up. It's good to know. We definitely don't always feel like we have parking, but at least we have a lot, right? Oh yeah, you've got a lot of parking. <laughs> we don't have any parking, so. All right, uh, one final question. Go ahead, if you have any additional questions, send them in the chat and we'll pass them off to Kirk, but. I know you ended your presentation, but can you give us a glimpse as to what's next for you and your team? Yeah, we are, we are, we are doing a strategic planning process right now. And, um, you know, obviously we're dealing with the virus like everybody else, but we are planning to have a public plan by the end of this year. I've got, as I mentioned, um, several spaces that could be new exhibits in the building. Um, I also have a huge scientific team here that's working on a variety of really exciting scientific projects. Um, one involving um, DNA in the oceans, another one involving the origin of life on the planet, another one involving formation of Earth's continents. So there's some pretty big questions we're trying to answer. But when it gets down to the next exhibit, it's going to be something around biodiversity and humanity, people and nature. Um, but that's a broad, 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 broad topic. And we have no resolution on that yet. So we'll be figuring that out. If you have any good ideas, I am all ears. That sounds great. Uh, I just want to thank you for joining us today, giving us uh, some of your time out of your busy schedule. I really appreciate it. And on behalf of our members and volunteers, thank you, Kirk, for being here. Um, Thanks, everyone everyone who joined, this is absolutely available. Um, we have recorded it um, and we will make it available to our members and volunteers soon. Um, in the meantime, thank you. I hope you stay safe um, and we'll see you next time. All right. Thanks, everybody. Great to see you almost. Bye-bye. <laughs>